and we're back for part two of the talking about running shoes. Yeah, I'm going to do a park run on Saturday. I haven't done one in ages. I don't know why I decided I was going to do a park run, but I did. So, yay for running five kilometres. I can definitely do it, but my legs are going to hurt the day after. Oh, fuck. Meant to do that. Styled it out. It's alright. Yeah, I'm not going to wear the new shoes to the park run. Because that would involve going to Sports Direct on Friday night. And I can't be asked. Um, so instead. Park run. Then go. After the run. Then, uh, hopefully I'm still able to go shopping, <laughs> like regular food shopping. I might do the food shopping before the going to Sports Direct, because that's probably more important. And I can go to Sports Direct on Sunday instead as well. But I kind of want to go for like a longer bike ride because I, I don't know. I don't actually know what I want to do on a bike at the minute. Because I don't have the patience to go out for a ride. Well, I do know what I want to do. I want to race, but I can't. I want to do time trials, but there aren't any within a reasonable distance of me. Leicestershire doesn't have a time trial league anymore since covid and it was kind of dying. It, it was undecided whether it would even come back in 2020. Because uh, there was lack of volunteers and not enough riders to really... Like, the minimum number of volunteers was more than the riders that were there. So it was like, okay, we're all volunteering so Dave can ride this week. You know... It's their fault for doing up the fucking A-road. It's out and up the dual carriageway to Nottingham. Fuck it, I'll dox myself a little bit. It's not completely a local one, but it's the closest one. And I've already said I'm in Leicestershire, so... Yeah, out and back up the A-road. You're going to need a few marshals for that, isn't you? Because you're going to need one at every junction we don't take, and one at every junction we do take, so that you can tell people to come back round. Yeah, because the thing is, I looked, if you go onto the Parkrun website, if you if you could open another tab and do it, genuinely go and look at it. Pick your local Parkrun, you know, pick a park near you, or, you know, type in your town, and pick a park you know the size of, and that you've, you, can, you can picture in real life. Um, and go and have a look how many volunteers a park run, a 5k park run takes because it is a, an enormous number of volunteers to make a park run work and the park run near me is three laps well it's it's two la it's it's an out lap and then two laps which in theory means you shouldn't need as many volunteers as if it was an actual 5k round now, it doesn't help because we run up the canal towpath kind of next to it. You need actually quite a lot of volunteers to tell people to not go on, run all the way to... <laughs> all the way to Nottingham down the canal. <laughs> because I've watched a couple of videos of people doing this park run on YouTube. And, uh... Knowing where it goes... Yeah, I can imagine people who don't know what they're doing accidentally taking the wrong turn, ending up on the canal and just running. And not noticing until they get to the next fucking village over, or by the time they've gone, there's not a lot of people around anymore. And I've run a lot longer than 5k, because the next time that you'd see anything if you went out of there, you would be in town centre. You'd turn up at the big park in the city and probably end up at their park run to be fair
But yeah, it's a lot of volunteers. So doing it up an A road, dual carriageway, are uh, like. So the reason for it, by the way, is because cars can overtake you. It's a dual carriageway, so it's fine, and you're not going to hit the speed limit and have any problems. So it kind of works. And it being an out and back, it's fairly easy, it's fairly straight, it's consistent gradient, it's... Damn it. I'm the wrong side of the barriers, I didn't even see them. You know, it's it's good. It's, it's how it's always been done. Oh, I'm going to get reset. Damn it! They put a rock... Oh, they put a rock there, because I guarantee you someone flung into that and just wall rode that curtain, even though it bites you. You probably could get away with it in one in a million tries. And this is the sort of game where nutters will go for one in a million tries. Yeah, it's the way it's always been done. You know, the, the routes are labelled with names. Um, are labelled with code numbers instead of names because you didn't used to be able to race. And the reason Britain has such a good time trial scene is because you didn't used to be able to race on the road. So they did secret time trials. Because if you got stopped by the police and they said, Are you racing here, sir? No, I'm just out for a bike ride on my own. Well, how come there's a guy one minute behind you, one minute ahead of you? Nothing to do with me, mate. <laughs> and if they come for your start or finish line, you scramble. <laughs> <laughs> or claim it's not a race, it's a group ride. But they didn't used to ride with numbers. Or oh, what they did they do? Quite a lot of the time. I think they did ride with numbers. But you'd put your number in your pocket. And you'd show your number at the end. Sort of thing. Because obviously. Bloke in a number. But you know it's local races so. Yep Dave's done it in uh, 28 minutes. That'd be a bloody fast time. What's national 10? That's a bloody... 28 minutes is quick. Yeah, now, uh, 10 mile time trial is your 5k run. For reference. A uh, bit longer in time. My 10 mile PB is... Where did... Uh, 24... Like 38 minutes. Something like that. 16.6 .6 seems to ring a bell. But 16.6 .6 might have been the local time trial route, which is only 8 and a quarter miles rather than actual close to 10. It doesn't actually count as a 10 mile time trial because it's not close enough. But yeah, that's where they host it. The, the other reason is that if you can minimise the amount of junctions and or make them all left hand turns. And this one, every junction has a slip road except for one. And it's a left hander. It's a left-hander where you don't have right-of-way, but it's a left-hander. So you don't have to cross a lane of traffic. And that's the only junction you come across on this 10-mile loop. Everything else is a slip road junction. So you don't have any sort... You know, you don't have to think about traffic because you're going to be in the left-hand lane anyway. And... I could honestly tell you the distance from the start line that I am of this uh, time trial and not dox myself because of the amount of 10 mile time trials that that is true for. You ride up 4 miles, you turn off at the junction that is 4 miles from the previous junction that you started at, you go round a little loop until you get back to the next rejoining, then you go back and the finish line is on the other side of the road from the junction that you started at and goes down as far as it needs to down that little lane until you get to 10 miles and you finish it so that you end up at a cafe but yeah there's no there's none of that anymore so I don't have a time trial I refuse to give British Cycling any money because uh, they're assholes so I'm not getting a race license also Nowhere to race near me uh, that I can get to of an evening. Closest place is an hour and a half cycle away, which, no thanks. Uh, actually, the closest place is an hour away. Yeah, there's a new, there's actually a cycle circuit in Leicester City. 
but it's an hour away if racing starts at eight you're going to end up finishing at like half eight so i'm not going to be back till half nine and have that and having ridden like 12 miles to get there raced and ridden 12 miles back and it's on a fucking wednesday night or something it's not going to be a friday Ain't happening. So, yeah. Bike racing's a great sport. You need a car to do it. It's daft. I really do think time trials are the best thing and that there should be enough of them so that there's a local league near you that you can cycle to as a warm-up. Because the other option is like cyclocross leagues and other racing leagues. You end up going from place to place to place all over the county. Or double county because the racing series I used to take part in as a kid was the Notts and Derby Cyclocross League. Nottingham and Derbyshire are quite big. And there's a race every other weekend for like eight weeks in a row in the winter. It is, uh, you know. Yeah. But as my dad told me, at least didn't complain like I did when I played football. Yeah, you'd literally have to ride up the day before and ride back, which isn't possible because they're all Saturday uh, they're all Saturday races pretty much. So you would have to take the Friday off. Which like I could totally do for nationals, but there's no point going to national in fact I'm not gonna qualify for nationals. I want to qualify for national hundred. Do you know what? Fuck it. Yeah, every Friday for eight weeks. In the winter, this is a cyclocross league. So maybe you could do it for criterium racing in the summer. Or mountain bike racing in the summer. Well, employer's going to love it. Dean Downing, UK pro. He was a site manager. Building site manager. He kept coming in knackered on a Monday morning because he'd been training, he'd been racing, he'd been, you know, over the weekend he'd been wherever, racing, track, road, whatever it was, mountain bike, cyclocross, and his boss came to me, he said, go and full time, you know, you're making a bit of money off the cycling, go full time at it, you can be a site manager when you can't cycle. You can't be, you know, you're 25, you can't be a site manager. You, you can't be a cyclist when you're 50, but you can be a site manager. So you just got to fuck off and, uh, and do it. Yeah, half decent boss. This is back in the day, though. Uh, Ross and Dean Downing, they're going to be, they're going to be old now. But I think it's it, it's one of those ones where I think it was his kind of his side manager, you know. So he was site manager, but his second in command or his you know his equal on the site was telling him to do it. Or it, you know, they say site manager, but you might have been in charge of the brickies or something. But to be fair, my, so my both my dad and my granddad worked in construction management, and unfortunately last year I lost three grandparents. But do you know what? Own the people who turned up at funerals. My granny knew a lot of people, and she was very, very well liked by a lot of people. So a lot of people at that funeral, but at my granddad's funeral, his boss turned up. <laughs> I think building construction management was different, it feels like. 
it's uh, it definitely ain't like that now <laughs> and that's why my dad teaches instead But also, my granddad built half of Leicestershire, as my cousin found out when he took him for a drive. And it, my granddad was like, see them? I built them. See them? Built them. Do you, do you want to point out the ones you didn't build, granddad? Might be quicker. Built them. Right. The only house he didn't bloody build was his own. Built the shed, though. That's asbestos. Great. As, as we looked at the shed and went, shit, we have to deal with this. What are we going to do? Because this, the good option that nobody's going to like is, it's fine, just don't break it. Therefore, don't take the shed down. It is 100% asbestos. Four walls and a roof. Asbestos. Fucking hilarious. That's best of woes. Uh, well, it's already coated, that's the thing. It's, um, on the outside, it's painted. And my dad remembers it being three colours. And we're fairly sure that none of them were ever taken off. You know, it was just sort of, oh, that's looking a bit tatty. I'll, sp I'll paint over it again. It's only a shed. You don't need... So the outside's painted. The inside, you can see raw asbestos. <laughs> it's great. But I, I think the problem is... You can paint over it, you can spray over it, but it's still asbestos if you break it. Like, paint's not going to stop that thing breaking, because it's the fibres that are the problem with asbestos. It's getting in your lungs. It doesn't matter about anything else. It's just the fibres. Yeah. I think the general rule of getting rid of it seemed to be you get a company in they basically put on put on full masks and everything and spray it um not sp so have a sprinkler running effectively and just create mist just make it so that the fibers fall faster because they get wet and fall, and don't, and then they don't dust and all of that sort of stuff seems to be the general rule of thumb. Yeah. However, <laughs> benefits of you know family in the construction industry and dad in the. Uh, building management industry at a university you can probably find one of them someone's probably got the license although honestly asbestos removal like this is a very morbid thought if you have terminal lung cancer go into the business of asbestos removal and earn your fortune at the end <laughs> it's not going to make things worse
Yeah, true, yeah. Because I did see there's a guy, um, saw an article about a bloke who did did these jobs that were just ridiculously noisy and, you know, people were really difficult to get hearing protection that was actually PPE safe and all of this sort of stuff. Uh, and he did it, he was deaf. You know, deaf from other stuff. Can't remember what it was, but it was sort of natural causes, not not too many gigs or anything like that, but just sort of, you know, and it was like, hey, money to be made here because I don't need expensive PPE. I can just get some that is good, you know, realistically get some that is good enough to pass the test, but who cares? Death. <laughs> Only really works if you're deaf, though. You can't, you probably can't do like working with lasers if you're blind. Yeah, basically, just stuff like that. But I think it was mostly jobs like um, jackhammering type stuff and running, running saw machinery and that sort of stuff. It, it was, it was one of those ones where the guy was definitely smarter than Smarter than some of the jobs, potentially not smart enough for other of the jobs because the fact that he did them. But, you know, whatever. Because one of them showed him, I think, walking between giant saw blades in a sawmill that looked like they were running. And it's like, yeah, I inspect the bearings on them. Right. I'd have thought you'd just stop them. My uncle works in a toilet paper, paper and kitchen roll type makey factory and he's an engineer and he replaces the bearings and stuff like that. You can hear when a bearing's gone. I can hear when a bearing's gone in my bike. But, you know, you know when a bearing's gone in these big machines. And they stop the machines <laughs> for one of the engineers, like my uncle, to go and go, yeah, it's knackered. What do we need? We need a this bearing. Right. Get one out of the store or get one on order. Schedule the maintenance for whenever. Piss them full of grease in the meantime. Yeah, there's been a few people that... Cycling seems to be the sport for that, but it might just be because I know cycling stories and obviously will read them and know the people involved. But there's a lot of stories about cycling. Yeah, I feel like this engine's two-stroke because it's putt-putting. I'll read the description. I bet it says. I bet it will say... Well, it's got to be two-stroke. It's an Indian tuk-tuk. <laughs> if this thing's not leaking oil, it's out of oil. Admittedly, I probably should clean the oil off of my back wheel. It's gone grippy. There's... It, it's gone grippy somehow. Which, by the way... Top tip, if you're watching this, do not use muck-off chain lubricant. It's shite. 
it leaves a horrible residue behind. Definitely do not use it if you have internally uh, internal gear hubs like a Sturmy Archer or a Shimano Nexus. If you've got a roll off 14 speed and you're putting chain oil in it, God, what the hell. No, no, it, it's supposed to get into the hub. You're supposed to oil it. You are supposed to use a thin lubricant, not a chain oil. Sheldon Brown said I could use a chain oil. Sheldon Brown's usually right. In fact, Sheldon Brown is always right. Because someone will edit the website if he's not. <laughs> um, but yeah, what it is, it leaves a residue behind that's really difficult to clean off. So it's alright if you're going to wash the bike every week. But eventually it just gets this residue that's... With no matter how strong of a degreaser you use, I used petrol um, to try and get it off. But it just, you know, bike mechanics will say, you are scraping the back of that thing. You know, if you've got it on the, like, chain, fine. Oh, stream dead? Nope. We're good on this end. Yeah, bike mechanics will say, if you've got it on the cassette, ain't coming off you know but it's 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 a good oil it stays on well it's just yeah don't use it if you want a wet lubricant that stays on well i recommend finish line wet lube don't use the ceramic one just the normal one it's cheap it stays on really well it's fairly thin uh, i use it inside of my hubs my hub gear it, it's fairly good Maybe get something a bit thinner if you've got a fancier hub than a three-speed Sturmy Archer. AW stands for Always Works. Um, don't actually know what it actually stands for. Just, uh, kind of the meme answer is that it stands for Always Works. And do you know what? Other than the one time where it gummed up because I had uh, muck off oil in it and I had to spray it out with cans and cans of WD-40, since I've been drip feeding it every couple of weeks with uh, finish line it's been good good as gold and it's from 1986 it's twice as old as I am nearly so is the bike <laughs> that it's in that I'm having to ride to work because I smashed my rear mech crashing on the last day of work but there we go on the posty for a bit. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's the thing. It's young for a Sturmy Archer. That's basically brand new. One of the last years, I believe, that uh, they were made before SR Suntour took over, which means that it's probably bad. But that's a bad one. I think they took over mid 90s. It could have been early 2000s. I want to put a Nexus in something. I really want to get a Nexus hub and put a Nexus in something. And I don't know what. But I want to. I would put it in my current road bike, but I've. Uh, my yeah, Shimano Nexus internal gear hub. Oh, fuck. Would put in me um, commuter road bike, which I've curr is currently having a bit of a dangling, as, uh, as previously mentioned, broken. Uh, the rear mech hang is dangling off. So, no gears at the minute. Would put in that, but they're like 120 quid used. You can generally get them for 100 quid, maybe. Bit, bit more than the 20 quid it cost me for the rear mat kanger, you know. If I smashed the whole thing to bits, sure, would put one in. But you know, like a hundred, even if I could get one, 100 quid for a good one. Then I'm gonna have to build the wheel, and I can do that. It's gonna be like 30 quid in spokes. And an afternoon. Or 20 quid, you know. 
or 20 quid in, uh, what is it? Or, I buy a, uh, buy a rear mech hanger like I did. And it's an afternoon recabling the bike. And that's it. And it's done. I will have a Nexus hub at some point, or uh, a fancier, uh, fancier internal gear hub. I know I will, because my next commuter bike, if this one breaks, my next commuter bike is probably not this. But the next time that I, the, the time when I buy an expensive commuter bike, it will be an electric hub driven, hub, a, yeah. Hub gears, electric bike, that I really wish would be the specialised turbo, but the twats are idiots, and they give it a proprietary headset, everything's normal, the handlebars, you can't buy a different set of handlebars, because the headset's a weird funky standard, because we wanted to do internal cable routing. Why? I don't care about internal cable routing. It would also be the rally. There's a really nice rally. I can't remember which one it is. It's really nice. It looks great. Why has it got front suspension? Stop putting front suspension on things. Schwalbe fixed this problem in the 90s when they brought out the Big Apple. Put a 2.4 inch tyre on your bike and you don't need front suspension. Because trust me, the, suspe the cheap suspension they put on commuter bikes is not plush enough to go boom boom. You know, yes it's going to save you when you eat a curb, but you know what? Stop eating curbs. Either learn to bunny hop or find the bit where the curbs dropped. Stop eating curbs. Suspension is for people who think that they need suspension. That's why they put it on bikes. But it is you are not going to find a suspension plush enough. Because you know what? I've got quite a nice set of suspension on my mountain bike now. 100mm travel. Nice. RockShox Recon. Um, you know, mid-range suspension fork. It's a bit old. A bit, bit worn out. But it's nice, runs smooth. I cannot get that thing. No matter what settings I put into it, I cannot get that thing plush enough to be enough progressive travel to eat up road buzz. But I don't need to because I've got two inch tyres on a mountain bike. And they whoop ass. So they suck up the road buzz, and that sucks up the bigger hits. And I either set it to like 45, uh, 55, 60 psi, and that's cross country setup, or I whack it up to 70 psi, and that means I'm going to hit some big stuff. And it needs to, and like I'm kind of, I'm accepting that the road buzz. And the trail buzz is going to take it, but when I hit a big route or flatland a drop, be alright. Mm, you definitely there is some good seat suspension coming out now. Reg is making some good stuff, and I kind of want one of their suspension stems because everyone who's tried one has said game changer. And do you know what? I can see it. I can see it. And as someone who rides a gravel bike all the time that's my my road bike is a gravel bike uh, well it's actually a cyclocross bike that I put gravel tyres onto and run as a gravel bike like I've been doing forever but yeah suspension stem people have said game changer and a lot of people have said because the other thing is it's actually a double upgrade in my sen in my case because if I get their higher higher end stem it's actually lighter than my current stem I think because my current stem is a beefy boy stock thick billet of cheap aluminium 
So if I get a really fancy £100 suspension stem, the thing's going to save like 20 grams. So, not that it matters, because I've got mug guards and off-road tyres and everything. But hey, 20 grams in a stem, that ain't bad, considering that the cheap... So the classic cheap stem upgrade, um, which everybody recommends you do, is... I can't, the Delta some uh, not Delta, Data something. The Data something or the Cali Uno stem. And the Cali Uno stem is quite lightweight, it's fairly cheap, uh, and it's kind of the thing that people say, if you're looking to save a little bit of weight in a silly way, you know, you want, you've saved a bit of weight, you've got some lightweight wheels, and you do a lot of climbing, get a Cali, and, and you're planning on changing your stem anyway, Get a Cali Uno stem. They come in good sizes. All of that. Data's the same. It's a decent lightweight stem for a de cheap price. And they don't have ridiculous weight limits. You know. You probably don't want to do downhill mountain biking on one. Because they are still a lightweight. Slightly fragile apart. But they'll definitely handle gravel riding. And any cross country you can throw at them. That, you know. People have used them for that. So it's one of those like. You might as well save it, because they're not that much more expensive, so you can have a bit of weight knocked off. Since you're changing it anyway. Although most people find it difficult to compare the weights, because obviously you're changing the stem, so you're changing the size. You know, you're at least changing the angle of the stem or something. So, yeah. But yeah, as a freebie... For a redshift stem is pretty expensive though <laughs> but nobody's copied it yet that's the other thing nobody's done a copy that isn't like just the old style we put a literal spring in the stem and it's actually serviceable because um yeah it's serviceable it uses as you could almost certainly make the blocks that change the spring tension because they're blocks of rubber. So you could almost certainly, if you're careful with a craft knife, you could probably make a pair, you know. But, the, you know, until they go out of business, they sell them. It comes with one of each set, I believe. It's kind of like comes with all all different things and it's like you weigh this much and you're riding on this put this one in but other than that it's fairly you know it's intended to be taken apart you know you're not going to destroy the thing you don't they intend you to take it apart and pick your suspensioning they also do a seat post which looks good but is very expensive very expensive and I'm still not entirely sure whether I'm going to put a dropper on one of my bikes but gravel bike with the suspension seat post would be super sick the reason I haven't immediately gone out and bought it is because I'm still sort of thinking like I like this bike as a time trial bike and I don't know why if I if I want to seriously do time trials I should take one of the spare road bikes that are in the shed or buy a road bike because you can buy a rim brake road bike with 9 speed for 150 quid uh, and it will be decent and just buy one and say sod it because realistically like I'd rather I know if I do time trials I'd rather have a bike that I don't change and the problem with doing it on a cross bike is that I change the tyres a lot whereas if I were to do it on a road and, and that's going to make a big difference Whereas if I were to do it on a road bike, I'd be like, I can pretty much buy like-for-like like tyres. Maybe I make a bit of a gain because a better set of tyres is on sale. And then the next time it's like, nah. Or maybe I go out and do longer rides or something like that. And I want a bit more puncture protection. And I end up with some mids. Like my dad. He was looking for a new pair of tyres, he wore his pair of tyres out, looking for a new pair of tyres, and it was a choice between the um, Lifeline Professional Race tyres, which were a bit lighter, 
and a bit less rolling resistance according to a rolling resistance test than the Schwalbe Luganos but the Luganos had better puncture protection and a thicker tread and my dad was like well I'm not quite happy about how long these last pair lasted they didn't last as long as I thought they would I'm gonna go with the same price but looking like they'll be longer lasting you know He's not the sort of person to notice the 20 grams and as he always points out when I'm like I bought this thing and it saved this many grams and he's like yeah, yeah I could lose that much weight and it's like I can't. <laughs> also it lets me put cool things on my bike like bells because <laughs> they're more fun <laughs> having a nice brass bell. Yeah, that's the thing, you you put a new bike, and realistically, I'm going to do the whole season on a tyre, you know, so at least the season is, unless I blow up a tyre, I'm going to do the whole season on one pair of tyres, if I were to have a bike like that, whereas my cross bike, there's a chance that I start the season still wanting mud tyres on the cross bike, and finish the season in the middle of you know, late in late summer, finish the season full slicks because that's fine for gravel in the full in the middle of the summer. And even if I had like a spare pair of wheels or something, that just becomes a pain in the ass. But yeah, I think. Like, I need a goal for cycling, I need to figure something out, and I think I can't, like, I want to do National 100. There's no way I'm getting qualified for National 100 this year. I don't know how you qualify for National 100. Um, but I think I'd like to do National 100, just to say I did it, you know. There's no way I'm going to win, because I'll be on a bloody road bike with mug guards, because that's me. <laughs> not proper bike if it's not what mug guards are. And like, I don't know, I feel like you can just turn up. I need to find out when the local 25's on, because that's a once a year time trial I can actually get to. It goes from a 25 mile time trial to a 60 mile round trip, because I have to ride out and back to it. About 12 mile each way, if that maths makes sense. It was 60 miles last time I did it. When I rode out to it and did it and then rode back. Uh, and it's a 25 mile round trip. But yeah. Or well, 25 mile, the actual race course. Yeah, I want to do that. Because that will be fun. And it's road bike only. Which means I'm not going to get destroyed by guys on proper time trial bikes. Just by guys who've got really, really tiny handlebars that are like the size of your knackers and uh, pull the hoods in really close they're like they're running 20 f they've been banned now can't do it except you can do it in time trials because time trials are different but um yeah they stop people so minimum bar width i think is now 34 millimeters at uh, 34 centimeters sorry not millimeters backstory time is this the last track? This is the last track. I'm going to load up some pictures because it, it, I can't explain how ridiculous the UK fucking scene has got. Because this has come out of the UK. Because we're the best at this sort of shit. Because we've got time trial history. Everything that has ever been banned by the UCI for being A. Dangerous. Or B anti-cycling in terms of aerodynamic gains has either been from the UK or Italy and all of the Italian ones have been specific equipment like spinachi bars whereas the British ones are stuff like ridiculously long socks and technical fabric because we spent way too much money at the Olympics one year Let's have a double check that I've done all of the tracks and then we will be done for the evening.
I haven't dated on all the trucks. 